OK, welcome, everyone, to today's Google Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangout. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst from Zurich, Zurich office, and I'm currently in the Mountain View office together with uh, two outreach specialists. Eric? Hey, guys. Hi, I think we're not live. We're not live yet? No, we're live. It says live. I think we're live. We should okay. be. And Eric. Hey, guys. Um, I have one thing I wanted to announce to you guys and get ready, but I actually didn't get it quite finished yet. But uh, we're going to be doing a alpha preview of a Webmaster Tools feature for search query data. And I'll post the link to a forum where you can sign up if you're interested. We'll probably have the forum open for a week or two. So if you're watching this later, you have to be pretty quick. Add your name there. Um, it'll be some, something neat that we're playing around with, that we're trying out. And we'd love to have as much early feedback as possible. So it'd be great if you guys find time to check it out, sign up. I'll probably have the link there maybe an hour or two after the Hangout. Anyone interested? Okay. Yeah. Sure. Joshua. Uh, yes. Hey. yes. I'd like to try it out. Like yeah, to meet. Me too, John. Can you drop the link in the chat also? <laughs> well, first I have to finish the form. Then <laughs> I. <am okay. laughs> but that should be ready soon. Um, I'm guessing that'll be open for testing around next week. So if you sign up, we should be able to set you up with that. And this is a very early alpha version, so things are going to change. Um, and it's really useful to have your feedback early so that we can kind of change based on your feedback. All right. Uh, does anyone want to ask a first question before we get started? It's only me, or is Baruch sound robotic? <laughs> Stephen Hawking. Try it again, Baruch. No. Uh, yeah, maybe we can get back to you afterwards. Uh, anyone else with a first question before we get started? Yeah, I have a, I have a question. Um, so uh, can you guys hear me OK? Yes. Yep. So I uh, work at a company called Redfin.com. Uh, we do real estate, um, and we traditionally we built all of our pages in JavaScript. So we rendered everything in JavaScript using a framework called Dojo. Um, recently, we learned about Google's JavaScript crawler and the enhancements that you guys made um, in this crawler. Um, uh, some of our pages. Uh, are being crawled by Google and indexed perfectly, uh, some JavaScript pages. Um, however, some other JavaScript pages, uh, Google is just not indexing the JavaScript content at all. Um, and when wondering, why is it that some of our pages are being indexed by the JS crawler perfectly, and then others are not at all? Um, what I do there is try it out with Webmaster Tools with the Fetch and Render feature to see if there's anything systematic with those pages. If maybe individual requests are timing out, if it's taking too long to kind of load all the embedded content, the scripts, those kind of things, you should see some of that in Webmaster Tools. The strange thing is when we use uh, the, the Fetch and Render, the page renders perfectly. But when we try to search for some of the JavaScript content in Google's index, we don't find any of the content. So we don't feel like the JavaScript content's being indexed at all, despite what Fetch and Render shows. OK. Um, it might be that we're crawling slightly differently and kind of timing out on some of those requests. Maybe from a technical point of view, we could crawl them uh, so they're not roboted. But maybe we're like timing out with individual requests when we try to get too much. Mm -hmm. It might also just be that this is still kind of early days for the JavaScript crawling and indexing, mm -hmm. that the, these kind of subtle differences still kind of play a role a little bit. And that we might be able to get some of the content in properly and render it really well for search. 
and other content we can't completely get in. Maybe we don't have the capacity to crawl your website as much as we might want to. Mm -hmm. uh, these kind of things could be happening there. So if you're patient, then that's something that I assume will get a lot better over time. Mm -hmm. um, if you feel that there's something systematic, that we're just not picking up certain mm -hmm. kinds of pages that you can <clears throat> look at in Webmaster Tools, but which don't really show in search, then if you can send me some sample URLs, that would be great, and we can take a look with the team. Yeah, can you, uh, how, do you how do I actually send you those URLs? Uh, just send me a note on Google+, Plus, a private uh, note. Just, just message in Google+, Plus. OK, sounds good. Thank you. Hey, John, I had a quick question for you. OK, go for it, Josh. Uh, very recently, Barry has mentioned that he is seeing an uptick in um, in changes in the Google SERPs, like as if there was some kind of algorithm release. I was just wondering if you could, um, I know if it's Panda or, or whatnot, you cannot confirm, but I was just wondering if you could confirm if it was Penguin, and if you still have plans, if Google still has plans to run Penguin on a monthly basis, or if those releases will be announced. Um, we make a lot of changes in our algorithms, so that's really hard to nail down to something specific. I don't think it's it's related to Penguin or the Panda update there at the moment. It was some kind of algorithm release. Uh, I was just wondering if you could, um, I know if it's Panda or. We make tons of changes, so it's it's really tricky. I mean, I I can take a look at what Barry wrote up, and maybe he has some sample URLs that we can look at and sample queries. But I mean, we make hundreds of changes every year, so you're bound to see some fluctuations. Some sites are bound to see these fluctuations a little bit stronger than others, and maybe that's just like one of the many updates that we've done this year. Is something that these specific sites are seeing. But uh, it's, it's really hard to say. Of course. Can you confirm whether or not Google is uh, committed to announce when Penguin will be released in the future, or are you moving to the monthly non-reported uh, version? Uh, we're generally moving to a little bit of a faster update cycle there, but uh, I can't say that it'll be monthly. Uh, there might be some changes there, some subtle like differences with the timing. It should be faster than the last one. So, not as juicy as you probably were looking for in the answer there, but uh, we're working on kind of moving that a little bit forward. Okay, and so just to be clear, it will be uh, announced when it releases, or it will not be announced when it releases in the future. I can't promise either one. I think if if it takes longer, if they're like bigger changes, we'll definitely announce them. If this is just like subtle updates that happen over time, then we probably won't be announcing them individually. Okay, thank you. All right, let's go through some of these questions on the side. Any here that you guys want to answer? Um, I saw one. <coughs> sorry. I saw one question about someone's site who got hacked, and they had malware found. Uh, and then there were a lot of like backlinks appearing for the hack sites, and they're wondering if they should disavow. Um, they're talking a little bit about uh, ranking change because of the hack content. Um, I think that's a really good, uh, quite good question. I think a lot of people, when they're hacked, they're they're trying to figure out what to do. Um, and and you know, <laughs> getting hacked is very uh, disheartening. Um, so the first thing is definitely make sure that everything's cleaned up. And so if you got everything cleaned up and you follow reconsideration requests or like after we recall and re-index, re re you don't see the hacked um, SERP label anymore, then you're probably good to go. Um, the second thing would definitely be to secure your site. You don't want to be rehacked again because we see a lot of people get rehacked. Um, and if you are seeing a lot of these backlinks, in general, we're really good at knowing that these backlinks are from like hack sites or like bad sites. So in general, you don't really have to worry about it. But if you do identify it, you should just probably throw in the disavow file just in case. I think that's just general good practice. Um, so um, yeah, if you do identify a lot of those links, go ahead and throw in the disavow file just to be safe. And um, in terms of like ranking changes, I mean, anytime something changes on your site, it's going to take a little bit of time to like. Um, for your ranking and, and everything to get updated again. So it might just take a little time. Um, just be patient with that. But in general, if, if uh, the hack content is gone, you should be good to go. Yeah, I can take that next one. 
So right. the next question is, do we use uh, social signals as a ranking factor? So social signals are really good for friends or people searching online for certain things like restaurants, but they're always changing and they're consistently being updated, you know, with people clustering uh, different things all the time and it's changing constantly daily or by the minute. So we don't use that as a ranking factor, but it's still very useful for your users or for visitors to your restaurant, to your site, to your blog. All right, here's an important one. Uh, is there any technical border for thin content? For example, 300 words is thin, but 305 isn't. Uh, how can we recognize that content is a problem? Do any of you want to handle that? Um, Are we OK with 307? <laughs> 305. 303.125. Um, no, I, I think, uh, so I've worked on the search quality team before. Um, you know, um, So we, we do see a lot of these sites. There's It's not about like a specific number that you're you're looking at, it's in general just looking at your user experience. If a user finds that duplicate content is like, it's not good to look at. Like if if it's very similar to something else, a, a user probably doesn't want to see you know duplicate results. So in general, I, I wouldn't be focusing too much on like a hard number or like a specific technical specification. Um, if you're really concerned, run it by a couple of your friends and be like, hey, I. I, I have this article, and this article, I guess, is similar. <laughs> Would you take a look and see if it's a, a good article? Like, is it significantly different? I mean, if, if you're, like, taking one article and kind of re-spinning it or, like, rewriting it, that, I, I think, in general, maybe then you have a little bit of a problem. I, I don't think you should be uh, doing that in the first place. Um, just make sure that it's content that your users want to see. I, I, I don't, I wouldn't focus too much on, like, a specific hard number. Yeah, the core of the issue is, are you making this site so that people can just find it on uh, Google search? Or are you just making it for search engines? Or are you actually wanting your users to find valuable information? And if that valuable information can be on one site, then why do you have separate uh, you know, thin content elsewhere? Yeah. yeah, so there's no number. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that's also useful because then you can focus on your content itself instead of trying to count the words because that's not really a good use of your time. Probably. All right, what do we have? Uh, is external link data and Webmaster Tools dependent on whether the links have been clicked or not? Um, in other words, uh, do old links suddenly get surfaced in Webmaster Tools because first time clicked and therefore added to the visible pool, just chasing a logical explanation? Uh, no, the link data in Webmaster Tools is really based on the links that we find by crawling. Uh, we don't look at whether people actually use these links to go to your website. That's something you could look at in analytics, for example, to see if these links are actually useful. So if you have an advertisement somewhere, and that's maybe a nofollow link somewhere, and you're wondering if, if it's worthwhile to keep this kind of advertisement there, then you could look in your analytics and see if that's actually something where users are going to your site, and perhaps even taking it a step further and seeing if users are actually doing something useful on your site, if they're converting, if they're buying something from you, if they're coming back. Well, maybe not if they're coming back, but if they're kind of like how they're going through your website. So from that point of view, I think whether users go through a link to your site is something that's useful for you as a webmaster, but not necessarily something that we use for finding links in on the web. We're pretty good at crawling the web. We've been able to kind of like follow links for a really long time now. So we have a lot of ex experience with looking at HTML pages, pulling the links out, and showing them. OK. Um, when will we hear if any of these suggestions will be added to Webmaster Tools? And a link to the Google Moderator page that we put up. We've been looking at it pretty often. Yeah, yeah we've all been looking at those. Yeah. There's really a lot of really great suggestions. And um, it's not just for the English market. Like We uh, got a lot of suggestions and feedback from our other markets, too. Yeah. So we've been looking at it. <laughs> I, I think this is something that's really useful for us to do like the longer term planning, but it's not something where you'd see 
as uh, like going in there and saying, oh, this is top wished item here, therefore we'll implement it next week. We really kind of have to plan the work with our engineers, with uh, the, the backends that we have to run. So it's not something where you'd see immediate changes, but it's definitely useful for us to understand where you guys see the issues and where you guys think that we could improve Webmaster tools. And like Mary mentioned, it's really interesting to look at this also across different languages because some languages have completely different wishes where they say, well, maybe in English this is like the number one item, but in French or in German or in, in Russian it's like, I don't know, on page two of all the wishes that they have. So it's going to be interesting to balance all of those things and uh, work with the Webmaster Tools team to find a way to, to get everything working there. Is that, is that moderator, moderator page still open? Or have you closed on? Maybe. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> but if it's still open, uh, keep, on, keep on throwing some stuff in there. I, I've seen some really good ideas, so um, if you haven't seen that one yet. All right. Question. If a home page without a trailing slash has a canonical with a trailing slash, but the canonical is redirecting 301 to the home page again, can that be a problem? Um, so I think, in general, in a case like this, you're kind of giving us inconsistent signals. On the one hand, you're saying that actually the URL is like this with a slash. On the other hand, when we try to crawl that page, you're saying, well, actually, it's the URL without the slash that, that you want to have indexed. So that doesn't cause any problems in the sense that we won't index the site at all, that we'll like demote it in rankings, but it'll make it harder for our, our algorithms to pick the right URL. So on the one hand, we'll see this URL. On the other hand, we'll see the other one. Maybe we'll fluctuate between the two depending on when we crawl. Um, but that doesn't change how this content actually ranks. So it's kind of inconsistent in that you don't tell us which URL you want to have shown, but it's not going to cause any problems in the sense that your site's going to drop in rankings or that our algorithms are going to think, well, this webmaster doesn't know what he's doing, therefore we're going to ignore his site completely. It's essentially just um, a choice of URLs that you're kind of giving us confusing information about. It won't cause the rankings to kind of drop. All right. Um, you want to take one? Yeah, I can answer this one. So we're very good about understanding whether your subdomain is related to the domain. Like if you have content that's specifically different. But at the same time, if you are on a ho free host and the free host has a lot of spammy sites, for example, then we may take uh, manual action on the entire free host. So it depends on what kind of free host you're on. And if uh, you see that the free host has a manual action and it's affecting your site, and you should also probably reach out to the free host, Pella Master, or other contact list to ask them to just clean up the site or clean up the spam on their end. So it could affect you, um, but at the same time, we're also good at understanding um, subdomains and if they're related to as separate sites. Yeah, and if, if I don't know if this perspective from someone like running the free host or, or just part of the free host, if you're running the free host, OK. If you're running the free host, you should be trying to get rid of that spam as soon as possible. Um, because there, there's probably just like a, we, we try to be really granular in our actions. So if, if there's something wrong and, and it's affecting the entire site, there's probably just like an egregious amount. Um, and, and if you're part of the free host, I would definitely tell your free host that. Like really point that out to them. Just be like, there's a lot of bad content and you, the people using your, your service is really being affected negatively. All right. There's a very uh, page-specific question. Would Google consider this to be a quality article? Um, I'd have to take a look at that, but I don't know if that's something that we'd be able to really like tell you that this page is fantastic or 50% OK. That's probably not the level of detail we'd be able to give you information on. I don't know what, what URL that is. I'll take a look at that later, just to make sure we're not missing anything exciting. Um, all right. How about this one? Um, I have a domain. I have domain.com slash UK slash IE slash US. 
And I want to move to country code top level domains. 70% of my users are from the UK with domain.co.uk for UK and domain.com for the US. I lose all rankings for the UK. Should I use a 301 redirect from .com to UK and a subdomain for the US? Um, that sounds complicated. So essentially, if you're moving a site from different subdirectories to new domains, then you should really have the 301 redirect for on a page-by-page -page basis from those individual parts of your site. Um, if you're using something like .com, so a generic top-level domain for individual countries like the US, like you mentioned here, then make sure you use Webmaster Tools to set the geotargeting for that domain. Uh, if you're using the .co.uk domain and hosting the US content in a subdirectory, then kind of keep in mind that we can't assign geotargeting for that. So we'll see .co.uk domain. And we won't actually like see that the slash US or the US subdomain would be geotargeted for the US. So that'd probably be a bad combination. But moving it to country code top level domains is fine. Using subdomains is fine. Using folders on a generic top level domain is also fine. Essentially, any of those work. And the one that you choose is probably more defined by what you want to do with your website, how you want to present it, than something that I'd say you need to do for web search. John, does um, hreflang also work uh, on those? So you can have .com UK and hreflang that, so say that's UK, and .com does say US and hreflang that, and that you should get the best of both worlds? Sure. You can definitely do that. Um, the hreflang markup you'd have to do on a per page basis, though. So it's not that you can do the home page and it'll apply for the whole site. You really have to do that on a per page basis. And there's a there's like an international targeting tool. I think we launched it like months, like six or seven months ago um, in Webmaster Tools. It's really helpful, and especially if you're going to do the hreflang markup, it'll tell you if you've made any mistakes. It's um, pretty easy to make mistakes on that sometimes. So I definitely use that international targeting tool too. Can I uh, ask a question? Yeah. Just a second. Oh, yeah, let me just finish this up. Um, if you do switch your domain, for example, just make sure we understand what the change of address to the 301 is. And you had a question about ranking there. Um, we pick it up pretty fast. There might be some fluctuations as you're moving your site, but we do understand it really fast if you set it up correctly. Yeah, so what, did someone have a question? Uh, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, so I have a question about how do you discount uh, links and um, when do you do that? Like, when does the algorithm decide, hey, you know what? We're going to discount this, like, basically half of the portfolio of, like, the site's links. In what case, uh, for instance, would you do that? Like, when? Um, so you mean the links to the site or the link? Yeah, so from... if, a site, if a site is behaving really bad, when do you decide to go ahead and discount the links or whatever you call it? It's just that it hasn't been answered, and I just wanted to know, like, I mean, when does it happen? Like, well, I mean, we, we we pick it up as if we can identify as a as a bad link, we definitely. Um, try to take action on it, whether it be manual action or algorithmically. Um, when does it happen? Probably as soon as we can find it and identify it as bad, I guess. Uh, okay. We don't, don't really mean, uh, if, if sites are really behaving uh, as they're not supposed to, I mean, I just wanted to know. I mean, maybe it could take a month, two months. I don't know. Like, that's why I'm asking. So I guess, like Eric said, like when we pick it up, Essentially, that's that's when that happens. And if there's something that we can pick up algorithmically, then we might be able to pick that up as we crawl those pages, as we kind of find those links. If it's something that uh, is based on our manual action, then, of course, when someone submits a spam report, when we run across that spam issue internally for other reasons, and someone from the web spam team looks at that, then they can take manual action on that, and then that'll be... Uh, Usually, I guess, within a couple of days or something like that. 
So the spam reports are uh, read uh, on a daily basis. I mean, I know you have a large team, but it's not as large for the entire. There's so many websites around the world, you know. So I mean, we we try to look at as many spam reports. I think we do look at most spam reports when they come through, and I, I can't say that it's daily. It's it's really based off of um, you know yeah, like you were saying, resources. But um, there's also a lot of other ways that we detect badness, so it's not necessarily just dependent on spam reports. So I mean, there's a variety of ways we can pick up um, someone that's um, trying to manipulate our system through linking. Right. Okay. When are like, when are we going to be done with links? I mean, for example, I just did a really successful campaign for a client. Uh, they did some viral some viral marketing and did Google shares, a few hundred tweets, and uh, maybe a hundred. Facebook likes, and they didn't get, they got like three links out of it. Uh, and the links that they got were just uh, uh, aggregator sites, social aggregator sites, you know, like like tweetthis.com or whatever. So they didn't get any links out of doing what I would consider a fairly successful uh, viral marketing campaign. Um, you know, when are we going to be done with links? You know, it, it, it's, getting, it's getting pretty difficult to find links, and I think it's, I think it's well time, in my opinion, that, that Google is tracking something else other than links, in my personal opinion. We have a lot of response for this that we use for crawling, indexing, and ranking. So it's not like you need to have links. And uh, for example, one of the one of my friends back home recently set up a new website for for the neighborhood, and they don't have any links at all. And they have, I think, over 300 pages are indexed. They, they're getting nice rankings. They're getting lots of traffic through search. I mean, enough for them, at least. And they don't have any links at all. So nobody has linked to that site ever. Um, they're submitting sitemaps. They have a RSS feed, those kind of things. But this website does fairly well without any links at all. So it's not the case that you absolutely need to have links. Um, obviously, it's still a part of our ranking factors, but it's not something where I'd say you don't get any links out of something that you do that you failed. Um, like these viral campaigns that you mentioned, that might be a fantastic way to drive traffic to a website. That might be something where we pick up other signals and use those as well. So from that point of view, I wouldn't say that it's like a fail to, to absolutely get links. It's not something that Google always completely relies on. But a uh, different search engine somewhere around the world uh, has tried that, and they went ahead and removed it. And I personally don't, you know, I don't think the results are that great, uh, based upon they tried it, right? I mean, I think there's, there's Yandex, why you still need links, right? Like yeah. Matthew said. I, I think links are really important for crawling the web because that's a great way to kind of like discover content that people are pointing at to discover related pages that are linked around. That's a great way to kind of go from one page to lots of other pages. So from that point of view, I think links is definitely an important part of the web. Um, I believe Yandex kind of removed link links, links from their ranking factors in some specific parts of, the, of their search. So it's not the case that it's completely removed. But uh, I think it's important to, to try these kind of things. And I imagine these are experiments that we run from time to time as well to see what would it be like if we didn't look at PageRank at all? How would the search results look like? What other factors could we look at? And I think that's something that any search engine has to keep asking itself and kind of keep challenging itself and saying, hey, just because this is something we've always done doesn't mean It'll always be like this. Uh, maybe at some point, people won't have any links at all. Maybe the web won't be in HTML anymore, but it'll all be in, I don't know, Flash or in apps or something like that. And these things happen. And it's not the case that we can make a decision and say, oh, the web should move to apps or to Flash or whatever. Uh, the web kind of does what it wants. And we have to make sure that we use what's happening on the web and provide useful uh, search results to people so that people still find our services useful as well. But it's not going to happen in a long time, right? Like uh, in SMX, uh, Matt Cutts was saying it won't happen for a long time. 
I mean, I have no idea. I mean, a long time is is a very very flexible time. <laughs> if you're looking at the web, something that happens within a year is like a really long time. But if you look at the bigger picture of like computers, then maybe a year is a really short time. But I I'm not saying that in a year we'll stop using links. But I know that we're constantly trying to challenge ourselves and figure out what's best for the user, how best to pick this content up. And you're going to see changes over time. So if you're an SEO or webmaster and you're saying, well, I have it all figured out. My website is ranking number one now. I won't touch a thing, and it'll stay ranking number one, then probably that's not going to happen. Things always change on the way. So John, then what other factors you pick up if you don't use social media as a ranking factor? Well, they're going to be in your previous comment. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't have anything offhand that I, I'd be comfortable sharing. But yeah. I guess, I mean, and there, there are lots of things. When, when you look at the content on the web, how, it's, how it kind of interacts with each other, um, I, I don't have anything specific that I'd point at where I'd say, this is a ranking factor, because then you'd all run off and try to game that figure, and then we wouldn't be able to use it as a ranking factor anymore, because essentially people are just playing games with it. So No, no. I, I, was, uh, I didn't want you to specifically say something. Uh, it's just for the reason you just mentioned. But generally speaking, that all the traffic from your uh, example earlier, I mean from Josh's example, came from social media. So everything came from social media apart from the links. And you're saying that you're using uh, some factors and you're looking at other factors. Then it's not links. Then what it is? I mean, just a general idea, if there you can, of course. I, I, I'd say there are lots of indirect aspects there, too, where maybe you don't get explicit links uh, from this, this kind of activity, but maybe you get like indirect links where people are saying, well, I'll bookmark this for later. And then they take that page and they recommend it to their friends on Facebook. And it's not like a, a link where you'd say, well, this passes page rank, therefore it'll be used for ranking. But your friends will look at the, the recommendations in, pay, in Facebook or wherever they're active, and they'll be able to kind of follow that, go to that website. And maybe one of these people indirectly will put a normal link on their blog. Maybe a newspaper will write about this. And these are all effects that maybe indirectly we might be able to pick up on. Obviously, we, we can't track everything, and we can't use like all kinds of social media signals for ranking. But uh, there are lots of indirect effects out there that we could try to pick up on and use for ranking. Um, I'm so sorry. Like Thank if, you. If people, are, if people are coming from social media and they're getting traffic from social media, visitors, sales, then it seems it's like not seeing the wood for the trees. Then why are you looking to Google to help you build links out of that? Why not just get sales, traffic, and customers from social media? Why not treat it as it is, which is another source of Sure. Traffic and sales. Well, because, because Google is still the biggest game in town, and we have no choice. No, I, I disagree. I, I think there, there are lots of chances to get other traffic to your website. And uh, that's not something where, where people have to put everything in, into search. I, I've seen sites that are really popular that are roboted out completely. They're services that, that don't even have a real website, that are essentially just have an app that maybe we don't even show in search at all. And they might get a lot of traffic. They might get a lot of uh, customers. It's not the case that everything has to lead to search. And right. at it some entirely point, depends on your business model. I mean, there are companies like Zenga that have just built games that people don't search for those. They just find them on Facebook or they're shared. I'm not saying my business could rely on it. It absolutely couldn't. But there are plenty of things now that appear on social media which admittedly are generally just clickbait. But they, they make their money from finding your social media, getting you onto their site, and getting advertising revenue. It's yeah. no good if you're e-commerce necessarily or if you don't have a good idea, but I'm not saying if you run a, an SEO company or you sell marketing services, that's going to be perfect for social media, but other things certainly are, so it's industry-based. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with you guys. No, that's fine. That's fine. We're, we're still sending traffic from search to yourself. No, just, uh, people are very used to uh, Google, period. You know, they do whatever they need to do, and they do it on Google. Uh, you know, it's just, that's yeah, how it is. I'd say the, the web evolves very quickly. So it's, 
people are used to Google now, that doesn't mean that we can just like lay back and say, well, they're always going to come to our site. Just like if you had a website that you don't change for a couple of years, then people aren't always going to come to your site just by default. True. So things things have to evolve over time. And so the practices, not I guess a lot of the practices we recommend also apply to any other kind of users that you drive to your site. If you have a really fantastic website that's useful for your users, then that'll work regardless of the kind of traffic that you're getting. It's not the case that you have to build a specific website for social media and a different one for search. You can make a fantastic website that just works for your users regardless of how they come. I'm probably going to sound like a broken record, and I'm, I'm sure everybody's heard about this before, but content quality and, and relevance are what's important to us. As a search engine, we want our users to have good content and relevant results. So, so when we're talking about links, things like links, they, they are a signal of good content and relevance. So don't think of links as like an end-all, be-all, like I have to get links, I have to get links. Or don't think of like social media, I have to get a whole bunch of clicks and everything. Just think about what your users are looking for. And if you're thinking about from the perspective of Google, what people are Googling and trying to search for when they're looking for your website. And so and going back to signals, like just think about it that way. Don't don't think about specific signals that you can like do or, or change somehow. Think about how can I make my, my content more relevant and the quality better. So I know I know <laughs> broken record, I'm sorry, but No no no, no. that's good. That's, let's ask it this way. Hey, hold on, Brooke. Let's ask it this way then. Um, if you just, have to choose, what, what is the better signal uh, for for Google? Relevance, directly tracking relevance, or indirectly tracking relevance through shared signals? Would Google rather read relevance directly and quality directly, or would they rather tell there is quality and relevance through indirect user signals, whatever they may be? Why not have both? Both, of course, is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> how, how good is Google tracking the former uh, post to the latter these days? Because it used to be the reason why you guys started tracking links in the first place is because that was a really great way of telling what was relevant online because everyone was linking to it. Now, with the technology you might have at your disposal, how uh, comfortable is Google directly looking at relevance and directly looking at quality signals as opposed to having to rely on third-party information? I don't think we have like, a magic answer for yeah. you. How about you measure it? It's a philosophical question. I'm asking for a philosophical answer. I'm not. I'm not looking for anything specific. I I think in, in general we try to find signals that that give us this kind of information, and we try not to rely on just one signal, because sometimes that can be a little bit misleading, and that that kind of applies across the board to everything that we're doing there. So, if you're saying either this or that. Like Eric said, why not have both? I think that's kind of what we'd aim for, to kind of confirm that the signal is the correct thing, that we're picking the right things up. And there's a lot involved there. And these things change over time. It's it's not really that, that trivial. We just want to basically, not, not, for, not for Google to be more transparent, we just want to you know, take care of our clients, not, because, not to make them number one. It's just to. You know, to make the the web clean in the end of the day, like our clients don't have the time and uh, you know to spend uh, on their website. I mean, there's so many things to do. So that's why I asked that question. I just wanted to know because there's a lot, when it comes down to competition uh, areas, um, be it contractors or something else, whatever it is. Um, a lot are trying. A lot of businesses are trying to manipulate, right? So that's why I asked that question. Yeah, that's always tricky. Find the right one. All right. John, I have a different question. Um, All right. Speaking Thank on you. the topic of uh, quality, uh, content quality, um, we know from the. I mean, we've heard about the above the fold. Uh, layout algorithms um, that ads above the fold are not a good quality signal. Um, is there a, a limit that would be, or even a range that we could say that this is definitely not safe? Because I, I'm thinking of a site that has been quite 
successful, you know, as a forum type site that gets millions of uh, visitors, but they they do have like a third of their space above the the fold as uh, advertisements, um, like sometimes running Google ads and stuff like that. Do you think that's uh, too much, or do you think that because they're getting enough other uh, quality signals that that would be overlooked? Um, I really kind of take a step back there and look at it from a user's point of view and not just like count pixels and say one third of this page is covered by this, one third is this. Um, but really try to look at it, how users would feel when they land on this page from the search results. Do they feel that this answer is their query? Uh, do they feel that this is relevant to them? Is this like high quality content that they find when they open that page? Or do they just get lost in a sea of ads? And that's something where it's really not, not the idea, kind of like with uh, the number of words on a page to say, well, the specific number of ads is good and anything above that is bad. But you really need to kind of take a step back and look at it from a user's point of view. OK, so uh, the, the, the user's reaction to that action reaction may, may be a more important. Uh, I think that's something you yeah. could look at. I mean, if this is your website, you could look at things like in analytics, how people are going through your website. You have that information. That's something you can interpret really well, because you know your website. You know what you expect users to do. And that doesn't mean that we're going to look at your analytics because we're not going to use that for ranking anyway. But that's something that you as a webmaster can use as a kind of a tool to figure out, am I doing the right thing? Other things you can do there are just like traditional user studies. Like Take a bunch of people that you think might be interested in your website, invite them to your office, and have them complete tasks on your website and ask them questions about how they respond to your website. And I think that's always really useful. That's not like one-to-one -one SEO technique, but it really helps you figure out which parts of your site people are responding positively to, which parts of your site they basically get lost in. John, uh, to Joshua's question, uh, like basically when quality raters come to the site, uh, just like they do on uh, Google Maps, is there a way that they can add a comment in, um, like an, I guess, an auto-generated comment in Webmaster Tools? Once they were there, I mean, they were there. It's it's not the case that we go to your website and we're like, oh, this is like seventy percent okay. Therefore, we're going to like drop it in rankings. Um, these these kind of raters, when they look at the search results and they kind of analyze the changes in the search results, they give us general information about the algorithms that we use for search. They're not going to kind of have feedback specifically for you as a webmaster. So. I, I doubt that they'd have time to submit like a feedback form for your website, but this is something where I wouldn't like focus on on that part of part of Google because that's not something where people are going to your website and like saying, oh well, we have to review all websites on the internet so that we can make sure that the search results are okay because that obviously would never be possible. So like really focus on your users. You know your users best. You know your website best. You know what people should be doing there. And that's something where if you make a fantastic website that works really well for your users, then it would be an error on our side if we don't kind of reflect that in search in the relevant Okay. Hmm. okay. Yeah, thanks. And, and uh, so uh, one other question about uh, forums that are uh, well used. If a site has a, uh, you know, occasionally gets some uh, adult content in a in posts, but maybe the site as a whole doesn't want to be uh, tagged or labeled as adult content, then um, the uh, a forum like that, should they uh, need to be uh, very cautious about allowing anything like that because the whole uh, site or larger portions of it may get uh, affected by that. Um, I mean, the pages can't be individually, uh, uh, I mean, or, or would you suggest if some some content 
needs to be individually labeled uh, as such that it uh, could be. Um, I guess first, first of all, is important to keep in mind that even if you have user-generated content, it's essentially your website, and you're publishing it. And if people are submitting something that you don't want to have published, then you need to find a way to kind of catch that at the right time. So that's essentially not something from our point of view where we would say, well, some random person on the internet submitted all the spam to this website. Therefore, we shouldn't count it against that website because it, some random person on the internet actually did that. But rather, you as the webmaster, as a site owner, are essentially responsible for the content that you're publishing there. And if we look at your site overall and we see there's a lot of junk here, maybe there's a lot of adult content on this site, then that's something our algorithms might say, well, overall, this, this site here is kind of in this category. And that's regardless of who generated that content and put it on your site, it's essentially you're the person who are publishing it. So if you don't want that content associated with your website, then make sure that it doesn't get published on your website. OK. Uh, but uh, I was thinking about uh, a site that maybe the uh, it is pretty well moderated, but there are questions or topics um, maybe related to uh, medical or medicine that have to do with uh, uh, adult uh, content or something like that, then um, th uh, is that s something they should uh, still I, I um, think that's, you know, keep, a, keep a handle on? That's kind of up to you. I mean, a as a webmaster, you kind of decide how far you want to go, what kind of content you want to have published. Uh, in general, we try to be pretty granular with our algorithms, but if we can't easily recognize which parts of a site are kind of adult content, which parts of a site are not adult content, then it's possible that at some point our algorithms will say, well, there is some adult content on here. Therefore, we have to be cautious with this website showing it uh, in safe search. So that's kind of a decision that you have to make as a webmaster and say, well, I'm OK with my website being like this. Um, I'll accept what people are publishing there. or Maybe you'll create a separate part of your website that has the adult content. You say, well, everyone who has questions on these topics should go to this part of the site, something that's either blocked from crawling or indexing or just clearly separated from the rest. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, and I was thinking it as a relatively small portion sure. of uh, yeah. the site. But, that's uh, essentially up to you. John, right. let's, Let's grab some of the questions that, that were left here. Uh, do you see any that you want to yeah. jump in? I like the question about the large image size. Which one? This one? Yeah. So All right. what are our best, best practices? So ideally, when you're making localized websites, you're probably, you have a product or you have a service in that region, right? So you know the hours, the map of the location, phone number, just anything that's relevant to the local place. And if they are in different languages, you know, use the HREP lane option too. And to ensure that it's not duplicate, like if you're making it for local regions, local languages, then you know you have different hours, you have different locations, you have different phone numbers, and we're going to understand that. And I see a lot of good um, examples of that. A lot of like cars sharing um, startups here in the Bay Area that's expanding to other countries. They're making a lot of localized websites, but on the same domain, but they have different information. You know, they have different prices too. And if you just look at some good examples online, then that should also give you some good ideas of what to put. Any other suggestions? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Do you have one, Eric? We can. Um, let's see what we have. John, can I just follow up real quick on uh, on Josh's earlier? statement? We'll try. Uh, <laughs> all right, thanks. It's more of a general concept of links. Uh, I was unable to join last week's uh, last Webmaster Hangout. Um, however, I, I watched the whole thing, and someone, they weren't part of the actual Hangout. They were asking the questions uh, on, you know, on the side, and they asked about getting editorial links for their site, and you seem to immediately jump on the, well, that sounds like you're doing something 
that you shouldn't be doing when isn't editorial links more going out and basically getting links from the value of our content I mean isn't that the best way to go about doing it um, I guess it depends a lot on what specifically you're doing there because what I see a lot is people saying that they're going to build like editorial links, but essentially what they do is just spam webmasters that happen to have websites with like similar topics and like, hey, you link to me, please. This is like really cool stuff. You should link to me, and that like very quickly turns into kind of almost like unnatural links that they wouldn't be there if they're not doing some kind of link exchange or something like. That. So that's something where I'd be really cautious. And a lot of times when we see people like talk about their links and say, well, I know I have some bad links, but I'm going to build a whole bunch of good links. And essentially, they just go out and spam a lot more than you're just digging a deeper hole rather than actually fixing any problems. And if your content isn't attracting those links by itself, then that's something that might be something worth uh, thinking about a little bit more to figure out why why it's, this is happening, why people are going to your site, but actually they don't want to recommend it to anyone. So that's so it, it's not okay emailing other relevant bloggers. We're talking about you know your brand or brands that you're involved in asking for links. Um, I I'm not going to like make any general statement and say this is always good or is always bad. I can see it. It definitely makes sense to sometimes draw attention to something really fantastic that you're doing if people weren't aware of that. But if you're essentially just emailing random people to ask for links, then that sounds pretty lame. You know, I, I don't know. Basically, like if if it was uh, if we're if we're going through an election, I guess the the states, the U.S. is going through an election, and if there's a fake vote. Uh, it's not counted, right? So it's it's all about getting real votes, right, John? I mean, in the I, end of the I don't know how the elections are handled in the U.S. <laughs> I have no idea. Just, right? It's all about real yeah, votes. So. votes. I, I don't know. I don't know how that works. They're handled they're handled poorly, John. Poorly. I, I'm sure that there, there are good parts there. Let me see. Here's here's one question about mobile friendly that I thought we would get to very briefly. Um, you said in the future, mobile-friendly factors can affect ranking of mobile search, but maybe not of desktop. Uh, currently, is you, Google is using many desktop signals for mobile search as well. Is Google going to index desktop and mobile sites separately? Um, so to some extent, we are picking them up separately already. Uh, with rankings, that's something that's been the play case since a while now. So I think mid last year, or almost two years ago, now, we, we did a blog post about different factors that could affect your mobile search rankings. And that's something that's been in case for a while. So if you do some of those things that we mentioned on the blog post there, then chances are that users searching on smartphones will see your site in a different ranking than they would on desktop. And that's something that I imagine will be moved forward as well. In the recent mobile-friendly label blog post that we did, we also said that we're going to experiment on ranking changes there as well. So if we see that an equivalent site is in the search results equivalently relevant, for example, and we notice that the user is on a smartphone and this other site is, works a lot better on smartphones, and maybe we'll show that one higher in search. So I definitely expect more changes in that direction going forward. Is mobile and uh, search, uh, like mobile, uh... Like, is the mobile and search different uh, right now? Because I'm seeing that it's not the same. Like, uh, for instance, the site will be number one on desktop, and then number three in mobile. I mean, before it was all the time, it was... It's, it's hard to say. I mean, the search results in general have been different since almost the beginning, where we'd like the composition of the search results would change. Uh, sometimes it makes more sense to show big images in desktop, but then it might do in mobile, for example. Uh, the ranking generally would be fairly similar, but even on desktop, you'll see changes from, from day to day, where you'll check on one computer, it'll be ranked like this. You check on a different computer, it'll be ranked different. And it's not that we're specifically targeting that individual computer, but we have experiments that are running all the time. We kind of take personalization into account as much as possible. And all of that can also play a role on mobile. And if you allow your location on mobile or something, yeah, there's there's a lot of different things that we can look at on mobile. So, okay. All right. 
Um, we think we might have been hit by duplicate content penalty. Once we've reached the issue, how long will uh, resolve the issue? How long will it take for us to regain our rankings? Do we have a duplicate content penalty, like a manual action? We do have a content? manual action that's specifically targeting thin content. Um, so if you file a reconsideration request uh, after the reconsideration request, it may take some time again with the indexing and recrawling. And in general, if, if you have those types of issues and you've identified it, um, same thing. It's recrawling, reindexing. It's going to take us some time to, to pick up these changes. And keep in mind that your ranking before might be inflated because of um, any you right. know, behaviors that you did that inflated your ranking. So it's going to allow us to understand where you fall naturally, and that might be lower or higher than before. So work on the content and get rid of that manual action. All right. Um, do, will we have time today to answer my question, or do you want to? Is your email enough to me, or do you want to leave it until next week? Um, I think uh, it's a good question. I think it'd be a good learning curve for the other people around, since it seems to be such a complex issue. Um, yeah, um, I I probably just leave it to the the Google Plus post that you send. Because I just want to understand how far to distance ourselves, whether you're talking about removing the domain from our ownership, removing uh, any links whatsoever, removing any hosting association, removing any hreflang association. I mean, totally distancing ourselves, or whether we're just talking about uh, ditching uh, the links between the sites. We only hreflang it at the moment. We don't 301 or anything. Yeah. You told us. I think if, if you're not redirecting from the old domain to the new one, then that's that's probably what we're looking for. Because so, we are we do HF Lang to tell people that I mean uh, in, in, But that was a workaround in all honesty. It's not it wasn't a they're both in the same country, but we were just trying our luck. But then you know that. We're not <laughs> I don't think the hreflang there would make a lot of sense, but it shouldn't cause any problems. No, but it did give us a short-term boost over a period of six to eight weeks or something, which then seemed to you then caught up with us uh, effectively um, and thought, actually, this is the same site. Then Go away again. I don't think that you, you'd see any problems in that. But uh, essentially, the the redirects, like in, in your case where you have one domain that has a lot of problems and you set up a new site, then the redirects kind of forward all of those problems to the new site. So if you don't no. have redirects in place, then that's that's really helpful for us to kind of understand that you're starting with this new domain. But at the same time, it also means that you kind of have to build up from that domain. It's not something where you can say, well, I'll take the previous standing and build from there but rather you're kind of starting over with that new site. All right. See, so previously you said 301 would be OK because it's not a link penalty and there's no penalty associated with that, so feel free to 301. But now yeah. you're saying, actually, the domain is so toxic, don't 301. I, I think in your specific case, I avoid redirecting now. Yeah. All right. So we're basically starting a new 10-year-old business with well, no... I don't know. It's, you, you still have a lot of things that essentially people know about. People are going to your site. So I think on, from that point of view, that's you're not starting exactly at zero. But uh, it's, it's definitely not an easy situation. So yeah. uh, I know. And we have to keep that live, that site. We have no choice because we're a gift certificate company. So people have that domain to visit within printed literature and have for the last 10 years. And in the US, gift certificates don't expire. So they have to visit it. Yeah. So we can't not have it there. But how far do we distance ourselves from it in order for it to no longer ever be a problem? Um, I, In general, if you're setting up the new site, if you're not redirecting, then that's, that's a good sign for us that these sites are actually separate. So same owners, same hosting, and same, you know, everything else should be fine as long as there's no links. Yeah. OK. All right. OK. So with that, I think we're out of time. 
Um, thank you all for joining. Um, next week will be, or maybe two weeks, I guess, we'll be back at the, the usual times, which don't work so well for California. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but uh, maybe we'll do some later ones over the course of the year as well. So thank you all for joining. Thanks for all your questions and comments. <coughs> and I uh, hope to see you guys in one of the future Hangouts. All right. Thank, Thanks, John. thank you all, guys, always, for coming. We really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.